And then we are live. Let's see if this works, guys. Uh, I appreciate all of your amazing patience, but this is a very exciting stream because we are live at the Pecos Festival, which is pretty awesome. I am uh, plugged in online so that I can make sure that we have sound. So just keep, let me know everything sounds good and, uh, and we'll go from there. Dun, 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 dun. Um, there we go, yes. All right, we do have sound. That's pretty awesome and uh, let me just say hi. So welcome, we do have a different mic set up now. Luckily we had a contingency plan so I don't get my wonderful little handheld Bitcoin mic flag there but you'll have to do it. I'm here at the Free Coast Festival in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Pretty exciting place to be. And I'm joined here uh, by Matt Phillips, who has a long history with the Free State Project. And I just wanted to invite him on just to kick off this live stream. I've got a long lineup of awesome speakers for you. Uh, speakers who are just here visiting the festivals, some speakers who are actually in uh, the festival itself who are presenting. And I just wanted to kick it off by just giving you a brief overview of what the Free State Project is and uh, tell you about this awesome community that's been built from like grassroots up that is testing out a new uh, way to be free. So it's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Polly, I am jumping channels because I had to fire my previous roadie, Naomi. She was terrible and her equipment didn't work, but all sorted now. I have a new one also called Naomi, coincidentally, but I think <clears throat> she'll be much better. So Matt. Yes. Welcome thank to you. the show. It's great to be here. Glad to have you here. I Thank you for having me here. This is great. Um, Tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me about your history with the Free State Project. So um, I first learned about the Free State Project about a million years ago. About um, a million. So yeah, it's pretty million. old. It's been going on for a while. Mm -hmm. um, Jason Sorens is the guy who came up with the idea for the Free State Project. He published an article in 2001 in an online libertarian magazine that said, hey, instead of libertarians losing everywhere all the time. Instead of us getting nowhere. Getting and government nowhere getting worse and, worse. and fast. <laughs> why don't we try to concentrate our efforts in one low population US state? So it turns out that about three years prior to that, Jason and I were fellow interns together at the Cato Institute. Oh, okay. Libertarian think tank in And just DC. a heads up, is there like a volume control on your mic or that's it? I think that's it. It's just That's it guys. Is, so. so just like, Listen real we'll, carefully. We'll speak up a little bit. We'll it's speak. also very directional, so yeah. you might be more in it than I am. I don't know. All right, continue um, talking about Cato. Uh, Cato. So, um, so I knew about it from the very beginning, and but I was just starting an entrepreneurial career in New York City doing ad tech, mm -hmm. and so I was like, oh, okay, right on, New Hampshire. That's great. I will check into that later. Uh, later turned out to be about ten years later, and I uh, showed up here in in twenty thirteen was completely blown away by how many people there are and how much buzz and excitement and momentum that we had and ended up moving here uh, later that year in 2013 and then uh, joined the board of the Free State Project and ended up um, becoming president for a couple of years until the very end of last year. Mm -hmm. um, and right after we triggered the move, which is we got 20,000 signers, so mm -hmm. 20,000 people to, to say yes, um, I will I will move there once we get 19,000 other people. So I actually first interviewed you on the Stossel Show in uh -huh. 2016, I think it was, yeah. where I went to Porkfest and we rode around a little buggy and yeah, like went yeah, up and down like a Gora Valley and all this. And, and that was when the move had just been triggered, yeah. right? That's really exciting. Yeah. So like the history of this, this pledge that people had to sign, you know, you had to get to 20,000 people. You got there 20, 2016 and that triggered this move, which meant that everyone who signed this contract then had to, you know, really try to, to get here and then try and create more freedom, right? Right. And what's interesting is that a lot of people moved here um, well in advance of that. Like, they didn't want to wait for this 20,000 signers thing. They wanted to get there now. And so we've already had a couple of thousand people um, move so far. Um, since we triggered the move um, at the beginning of last year, we um, our, our mover rate has... Um, I just was talking to um, Rachel, who you'll probably hear from later in this uh, in this live stream, um, who's our executive director now of the Free State Project, and um, she was telling me that it looks like we're on track to double our mover rate so far this year, year over year. So how many people, like, do you estimate have actually already come here? So it's a little over 2,000, uh, 2,000 mm -hmm. and, and change. I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head. So, like, just so we can get an, a brief, like, 
some comparison yeah. for these numbers. So, like, how many people are in Portsmouth in general? It's a it's a pretty small town. So, twenty Portsmouth has about twenty thousand uh, people who actually live here. So, Portsmouth has twenty thousand people, and you're saying that you're going to have twenty thousand people who believe in freedom moving to New Hampshire, and a lot of them are looking at places like Portsmouth, Manchester. So can you imagine like doubling the population in Portsmouth, first of all, and then being able to walk through the streets and one in two, one, like one in area every two people you speak to, you could say taxation is theft to them, and they get it. So I just, um, that's, I mean, this happens all the time. I just flew in from the West Coast. I was out at Burning Man, and uh, I flew in on late Thursday night, and I was a, flew into Manchester Airport, and um, just bumped into Jody Underwood, who's um, also a longtime Free State um, Project, um, you know, mover and board member and uh, activist. Um, she's very involved with the school choice mm -hmm. uh, movement here. Just that happens all the time. I just always, I'm always I live just right near Manchester. I'm always bumping into people that I know. That's so cool. And um, it's one of the things that's really hard to sort of effectively communicate to people is. Yeah, yeah, political activism and getting involved with the system and, and educating people and everything like that. But f forget all of that. There's just this really vibrant community of, of, of individuals here who are like-minded and we all share the same philosophy. And just being able to hang out with those people on a regular basis is so, it's like one of those everyday um, occurrences that like is I so powerful. even speaking to you two years ago and you were saying like every day of the week there's something going on. Mm -hmm. You've got the meetup on Mondays which is over here and then you've got Tuesday music night. Right. <laughs> or Bitcoin Tuesdays no. is Bitcoin beers yeah, at, or you have at like Murphy's. Poker and, night, yeah. Or you have trivia night or like I was just chatting to people outside about all the different sports for people to play. Mm -hmm. You've got like a soccer team and you've got a basketball team and you've got a badminton mm -hmm. team. You know, like you've got all of these things uh, that people can enjoy. Um, uh, this Okay, everyone's saying that the sound is really low. It's really low. I'm wondering okay. whether we should just take out the microphone and try the normal. We try that. Alright, yeah. right, you guys let me know if this works a little bit. Well. If this is a better sound, you give me a heads up. Alright, um, we'll see how that goes. Da -da, let me know how it goes. All right, then I'll say anything. Else. Um, so we'll just presume that. Oh, actually, uh, could you, Jeremy? Could you close the door? Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, is that better, guys? Roger, I'm sorry. It's oh, it's much better. All right. right. Great. So your microphone sucks. sucks. Uh, right. My microphone sucks more though. So story is, it's hard to do live streams on an iPhone Seven uh, with the lightning mm -hmm. connector mm -hmm. and yeah, the all the equipment really sucks. So if you have recommendations, please let me know. Um, Where's the free market when you need it? Uh, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, all right, we were talking about like all the different things that you can do around New Hampshire at the moment. Yeah. Like I just, I just find it fascinating because I live in New York at the moment and I'm really lucky that I have a lot of really close friends there who are libertarians. And um, although I'm usually far too busy as New Yorkers always tend to be because we make ourselves too busy, like when I do get the opportunity, it's great just to sit down with like-minded people and just discuss ideas or play board games knowing that you all start from the same place. Right. And then you, you look at New Hampshire and it's like that on overload because not only is it you know, people that, that are like-minded you can discuss ideas with, but they're like way more of them. It, there's it's, it's there's way more of them, and when you have one of those ideas about like, hey, maybe we should do this, like six people will be like, yeah, let's the actually do that. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so stuff actually happens here. Um, you know, businesses get started, and uh, well, they well, like a head of haircut. By oh, the way, they do. Okay, just thanks. Saying, yeah. <laughs> Better than nice. the, the long hair. <laughs> No, but it's um it's really cool. Like so, last night, what well, we kicked off the Free Press Festival, we went to this new space called Praxium Space, which is basically the community got together and said, "Hey, we want a place where we can hang out." So when you have meetups, especially in New York, it's it's kind of balls because you want to chat with people. And where do you go? Like you can't really invite strangers to your house, so you have to go out. The only venues available like pubs and cafes, so mm -hmm. it's just so loud. If you actually want to go out and chat with people. How do you do that in a place where, you know, the only spaces available are, are commercial like, right. restaurants and things? So p c people in the community got together and they bought an old, like, beer hall, I think it was. It's this giant venue, and so last night we had, like, the opening party for that. Everyone just joining together, and it's so cool. People can just, like, 
rent out this space or like have a membership where they can use it for anything that they want yeah. and you can just have you can have like a monthly uh, or like a weekly or a nightly meeting yeah. there where you just and chat with people and play games and, and there's classes for kids and, so cool. and martial arts courses oh. and um, <laughs> you know monthly meetups potlucks yeah. um, all that kind of stuff that's happening there and that's not just here in Portsmouth there's you know um, organizations and groups and, and clubs like that um, in a lot of different places in the state all right, so they, um, I'm getting mixed reviews. Uh, Derek says that the, the sound's much better, but I'm... I'm <laughs> you guys are hard to please, all right? I, but uh, once we crowdfund that giant studio of mine, uh, we'll have everything plugged yeah, in, and I'll have 75 like people truck, working yeah. for me in my trailer, and it'll be really great, guys. So until then, mm -hmm. we've uh, got the sound is Well, it's really exciting what's happening with uh, Free state, like yep. free coast festivals for people basically on the coast. Um, it's actually called the Sea Coast, so they have a bit of a play on lines there. Uh, but it's really a festival for all people in New Hampshire to celebrate being part of the Free State Project, right? Yeah, and we have we have a lot of different annual events now. Yeah. Um, there's some that the Free State Project directly organizes, and then, for example, this one, the Free Coast Fest, is actually organized by the group that's out here on the Free Coast. Um, and it's a little bit more entrepreneurial focused. Uh, tomorrow, all day, they're doing a sort of series of, of like Shark Tank style pitch mm -hmm. pitches, and um, you know a lot of. Um, I'm actually going to be in the in the call the Porcupine Den. Uh, it's like a Shark Tank, and I'm I'm going to be in it. So uh, I, there's no like online voting or anything, but just like send me moral support and yeah. stuff. Yeah. All right, well, it's going to be pretty awesome. Thank you so yeah. much for chatting with yeah. me, and um, best of luck to the Free State Project. I really admire all the people who are part of it. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I will be uh, part of it soon. But we'll you wait and see. Wait. And uh, and in the meantime, I will just live vicariously through all your wonderful events that uh, we don't have in New York. Yeah. Uh, thanks well, so much, right Matt. It's yeah, awesome. Right. Great. See you next time. All right. Jason says the sound is fine. Just keep going. Thank you, Jason, for letting me know. I uh, you are the absolute best. All right. Let's get the next victim in here. We've got some awesome people. So up next, I actually um, I met this gentleman at Pork Fest. So he has a lot to do with mesh networks, and uh, and he, he's going to explain to you what what they are. But um, it's uh, I'm going to be like a little bit. Um, so, alright, so everything is good, we'll just, uh, just close that door. We got it, alright, so, uh, this gentleman here, his name is Patrick, I met him at Porkfest because he set up a mesh network for the campground, thank you so much yeah. for, for joining me here, and, um, and I just want you to talk to me a little bit about what is a mesh network, I mean this term gets thrown around a lot, I know there are a lot of people out there who are probably interested in the idea but don't know anything about it. So uh, first of all, explain what you were doing at, at Porkfest. Yeah, so at Porkfest there's always a problem of, of, of internet connection and then a lot of anarchists trying to use cryptocurrency to pay for things, right. uh, which don't go together well. Yeah, imagine this scenario where you're using a cryptocurrency that requires the internet, but you're in the woods because there are also people who like to be off the grid and away from like big cities. Like, it doesn't really fit very well together. So you were setting up a mesh network then. Yeah, so other people other years have, have used uh, off-site internet to beam internet into the Porkfest area and then serve a small area. Mm -hmm. uh, with the mesh network, we're able to set up multiple routers mm -hmm. that are talking to each other. And so they're resilient because if one goes down, there's multiple routes to talk to different routers, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So you got one over here, one over here, one over here, but they're all connected. This one's got two right. connections, this one's got two t connections. I see. And they keep doing that so that you can get from point A to point B mm -hmm. an internet signal um, uh, reliably. And so we were able to do that at Porkfest where we had an internet connection and people were able to get uh, cryptocurrency transactions out throughout the, mm -hmm. the Aurora Valley area, throughout a larger area than you could service with one router. Right. Um, and then uh, it's, it's an idea though that's been coming, I think, back into uh, popularity after a bit of a, a lull because of cryptocurrency developing mm -hmm. and the idea and of like, meshing the two. So why, what, like, why are mesh networks helpful to an average person? Why would people think that they're important or useful? They're not. <laughs> They're really not. Uh, so it can be kind of uh, slightly like you'll see new commercial devices that are uh, you're able to mesh your house, and so that's a it's a different way of adding on routers to get better connection in your home. Um, but the technologies that I was employing at at, at Porkfest aren't really that useful to the average person. What they need is is a commercial 
um, use. And that's where the, the industry is going right now. The scene is going right now. I think it's where it's going. There is some resistance to that because all the technology was written in open source groups, in hacker groups, in, in people that were just really liked the idea of, of having uh, uh, alternate ways to route, route data. Mm -hmm. um, but now... It's going to be an empowering tool, right? Like yes, exactly. Like Matt Mesh Networks, I know that with Yetlika from... Um, uh, Liberland has set up like the largest mesh network in Europe. Um, doing things there because it can provide an alternate, an alternative to people. Like for example, if um, they're getting blocked from certain sites, can't they yes. see an option so that they can? So mesh network, network teams to... have set up mesh networks uh, in Egypt, in Turkey, in different areas that were under political strife mm -hmm. uh, to keep communication networks going, and that that's a really good use of it. So there is scenarios where the maybe not the average person, but the average person could be in a scenario where where having access to it's not like cryptocurrency, right? It's right. not necessarily it's not necessary right, right now. now. But yes, exactly. Um, but there are all sorts of use cases where you right. want to get around with governments and whatnot, right. in which it can be useful. Um, but for the average American, especially right now, or the average uh, uh, developed world uh, person, it's not it's not really that useful of technology. But it's becoming possibly more useful with the advent of mixing mesh network uh, with cryptocurrency to deliver commercial ISPs. Mm -hmm in a more decentralized way. Break up the Comcast, the, these at and the companies that have mm -hmm. huge monopolies over uh, serving the internet in any town but or city. But how does it break them up if you're actually feeding off their internet and then just routing their signal around? So you're so, not feeding off their okay. internet necessarily. So right. right now, a lot of the larger internet, uh, uh, a lot of the larger mesh networks around the world uh, were out of a need of, of areas that didn't have the infrastructure. And so someone over here wants internet, but uh, you know, the person running the phone line isn't willing to run it down the street. Mm -hmm. But if each of the neighbors, every two houses, or every house or so gets a router, then they can actually get it there. That's um, interesting. I actually read something uh, online. There's a network, mesh network in New York mm -hmm. at the moment, which I think is super helpful because a lot of the buildings in New York, they like you only get one choice of internet service mm -hmm. provider. So I live in a building, and uh, anyone who's seen one of my live streams from my apartment will know that my internet conks out at least once or twice a day, and often in the middle of live streams. So that's something that I deal with there. Yeah. And it's amazing because you call this internet service provider, and you're like, there's an issue, and they'll be like, no, we just checked your man. It's great. Right, it's it's fine, like, it's clearly right. not great. And, and so they just don't do anything. They have no incentive to, to, right. to do anything. Um, and there's no option for you. You can't just say, okay, well, screw you, Spectrum. I'm going to go with super duper fast super right. alternative, your main competitor, because there is no main competitor. Right. They're and the only ones around. And NYC building. Match is, is actually providing a bit of some competition there, some pressure. Um, they're doing it as like a, really as a non-profit. Um, so, and, and they're kind of a hybrid mesh, uh, but they have, they allow for really high speeds because they're not reselling anyone's internet. They are directly connected into the internet. They have their own fiber optic link right. into the internet. And they're just um, like hopping through so that you can get that. So their story is really interesting. I was able to meet some of the, the two guys, uh, main guys behind this at a mesh networking conference in Berlin, Germany, and it was. Uh, what they're doing is, is they've got these super nodes, basically, and so they've got these fiber optic connections up to these antennas and then feeding other antennas, and then people feed off that. Nice. In addition to that, they've also been able to use this thing that Google and NYC did called uh, NYC Link, I think it's called. Okay. And it's a, uh, basically, in Manhattan, they ran fiber optic up, at, up the streets, right? Or it's already up the streets, and Google and the city have installed wireless access points in these little devices along the yeah. sidewalk. If you live in that area, you can connect to them and get high speed, but you're going through Google. Right. What they've done is they've modified their software where if you're living next to them or next to one of these uh, NYC links, you can connect to their mesh network encrypted through the fiber optic link. Right. It doesn't even leave Manhattan. It goes straight to Google's fiber uh, uh, data center over to the one that their link is and then out to the internet. So as far as Google knows and the city knows, they don't know any of your traffic. It's all encrypted until it gets to the nonprofit. Of wow, because that's like a huge um, uh, problem with using Wi-Fi in different channels is that you, I mean, it's not secure at yeah, all. Like right, exactly. you're hooking into Starbucks or to the, the NTA, finally they have some bad form of internet um, to you know match their right. bad form of public transport. Um, and it's not secure. I just don't <laughs> know. It's terrible. So you're saying that this is actually using that infrastructure yeah, yeah, and it's kind of a novel. secure yeah. um, connection to people. That's he, he explained awesome. it as it's, it's like an antenna in the city for, for their network. Alright. So we're hoping to do something similar here in, in uh, New Hampshire. You, 
we're uh, speaking to Matt just now about you know being able to get projects going, and I was able to reach out to the community and find people because I, I know certain parts of this technology, but I can't build the uh, software for the routers, and I was able to find people in the community that were interested, live here in New Hampshire, and they're like, yeah, I'll, I'll build this, I'll do that, I'll do this That's part, so cool. and uh, that brought together the Mesh Network at Fort Fest, awesome. and as we're keeping an eye on these other projects, we think it will go somewhere where... Um, we can really break up the monopolies of the Comcast is and the That sounds AT really exciting because, I mean, you just look at this leverage points that the government have yeah. currently. If they want access to all of your data, all they have to do is just provide a, a warrant to one of these companies or just yeah. provide, like, you know, a document that says, hey, we want a backdoor in here. That's right. what you do. Like Australia, oh my God, what do you do in Australia? They, they have all of these companies under their thumb now mm -hmm. and the government now has a backdoor to every major chat, social media provider, uh, internet company, right. phone company that you're using. And there's a 10 year jail sentence for whistleblowers who mm -hmm. want to call out any of the things that are going on and let the public know right. about you know, data that's being intercepted. So if we can find more secure ways to be accessing the internet and uh, using like communication networks, that sounds Amazing. Yeah. And we definitely should be pushing more things like that. Yeah, definitely. The monopoly part's like that's part of the problem, but really the problem is that they also collude a lot with yeah. like <laughs> And there's nothing that the companies can do, even if they have like a you know, good heart or whatever, if the government gives you an order, right. your choices are okay, well, I will go to jail for And the first order is don't talk about this. Exactly. Or you go to the lava big guy and Absolutely. you just shut it all down and, and say I'm not gonna I can't tell you why, I just yeah. shut down my business. Yeah, you know, some of these companies have like warrant canaries and they go off yeah. and like I still can't talk about it, but everyone knows what's happening. Exactly. Like, it just can't be publicized. So it's very scary and I'm really excited that people like you are doing awesome work to give people more freedom in, in their search. Thanks so much for yeah. joining my Thanks team. For having me on. Okay. So we are up for the next one. Uh, Roger, I hope that you can hear me better now. And I'm sorry you're twitchy uh, with the sound. Um, but I, I'm going to look into more better sound options. I thought I had one, but my thing just cogged out today. So who knows what's going on there. The next person I'm chatting to is Jeremy Kaufman, who is from uh, Libra.io. You want to come over here? and. Uh, We'll chat about that. So introduce yourself to everyone. Hi, I'm Jeremy Kaufman, the founder and CEO of Library, spelled mm -hmm. L-B-R-Y, and our website is lbry.io. We, yeah, mm -hmm. So yeah. I actually uh, first met this gentleman, I think maybe one or two years ago, um, when we did a piece on Stussel, uh, for Stossel on this network, because basically uh, MIT, a lot of these universities, they got told that they, because they were all providing all of their um, university lectures and everything for free. That's amazing. You have like these incredible resources at your fingertips, and the universities were, were giving it to anyone to use. And um, then you had these ADH, what, 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 the ADA, yeah. ADA rulings that basically said, oh, actually, you can't give away these lectures for free because there aren't good enough subtitles on them so deaf people are missing out. And it's like, okay, so because deaf people are missing out, everyone should miss out. And that's basically what the government enforced. They said, you need to take these offline, um, or the, the, the universities didn't have the resources to go and add all these things, so they couldn't actually provide these, these services. So you actually have an awesome company uh, called Library that merit all of these lectures and said, hey, we'll do this. We will uh, uh, put these lectures and make them available. So that's how I first found out about them. But then it turns out it's so much more. Like this whole platform is this you know, social media platform where you can earn money. And it's, it's, I've just been getting into it in the last couple of weeks exploring it. So it sounds very cool. Yeah, so that's exactly right. Uh, I, everything you said, so there were these lectures that were gonna disappear uh, from the internet. It's actually not, it was a legal challenge. It never went to court. So right. I correctly said, hey, you know, we'll just take them offline. We don't want to fight. Because I mean, yeah. who's gonna go against yeah. that? You yeah. just have the, all of these dispersed uh, results uh, where you have individuals who would love to have access to these lectures. You know, that, that it's not worth it for them to go on a huge fight against say, the university and say, no, please, you know, give us, yeah. give us these lectures. So they just, you know, they just had to deal with the outcome. So, so what our company has done, and actually it was uh, community members of, mm -hmm. uh, of users of our software, not, not us. Specifically, they used our technology. Right. Uh, but our technology makes it possible for anyone in the world to publish and distribute digital content. Anyone else in the world can access it. Uh, we can exchange value related to it, uh, pay people, tip people for it. Uh, but there's no, there's no, that central point of censorship that exists when we use Google or when we use Facebook doesn't exist. Uh, when I try to explain what library does to, to my mom, I say, you know, we make YouTube possible, but there's no Google. 
that it's just that's it's cool. Uh, that's so it's like so your site basically people can pay and you, like tip you in the library token. Uh, explain to me the mechanism for how it works. Yeah, so you can act, download our software from our website. When you're interacting with the library network, you're you're actually not over the traditional internet, or at least you're not over the traditional web. Mm -hmm. uh, we've created a separate a, a protocol separate from. HTTP that has been designed from the ground up to provide the, these properties that I'm talking about, uh, and I don't I can get into the technical specifics yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, really really we won't go too down, far down the rabbit hole, but I'd love yeah. to have like a free token. So I mean, a blockchain. If, if I had to map the word blockchain to another word, I would first and foremost map the word blockchain to database, mm -hmm. and it's a new type of database that allows us to store information, but there's not one party that's in control of what's going into that right. database. So YouTube controls what's in the YouTube database. The No single person or entity controls what's in the Bitcoin blockchain database. Mm -hmm. And similarly, no single entity, including myself and my company, controls what's in the library blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, and our blockchain has been designed specifically for the use case of publishing and distributing digital content. I have a question. So. Um not saying that I want to do this illegal activity, but let's say that when I do a cover of Taylor Swift and I put that on YouTube and it gets flagged and they say, no, this is, you know, you can't do that. If I want to put stuff on library like that, can that get taken down? So it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Our company is a United States based company that's doing its best to comply right. with laws. That so they're like, because of your jurisdiction, there's certain things you like, you have to work within. So, so when you publish something to the library network, our servers aren't receiving it. Our servers aren't hosting the content. Okay. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network, and the data itself, the, the metadata, the information about your content is being written to the blockchain. Okay. So if we if we receive a DMCA, um, which we have, and we publish these, you can view the DMCAs that we've received, uh, and we, we register the content that we've been told is DMCA, uh, is, is in violation of the DMCA, okay. and we provide a service that those who are interested in using the software legally subscribe to, so mm -hmm. that they're not accessing and distributing that. Yeah. But the design of the technology doesn't allow us to go out to your computer and remove it. I see. Right, and it doesn't, and it can't force us to make someone remove listen it. to right. us. So, so it, you know, a lot of the technology that we, our our attitude is, people should be able to make choices for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's a foundational philosophy at our company. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of the business proposition of library is we're trying to succeed by tying our own hands. You shouldn't trust YouTube. You shouldn't trust Facebook, even if they're being nice to you right now. Right. Simply be caught. Exactly. Second. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and and so we're kind of saying, well, you can trust us because we can't change these things. You shouldn't trust me. I mean, even if you think I'm not going to do that personally, my company could get bought. I don't own the company mm -hmm. fully. I could, you know, I could change. I could yeah. die. I could get caught. You, know, yeah. you never yeah. know when a person like is being blackmailed or someone, you know, the government has something. I mean, they have just like. Troves of information on all of us, metadata, actual data, and so they have a wealth of information that they can use as pressure points for coercive, um, for coercing people to, to do what they want to right. the line. So it's great that now we have all these systems that you know they're recognizing human behavior and they're not denying it. Right? They're yeah. saying, listen, people can get corrupted, people can be coerced, people can have you know be nefarious people with bad motives. Uh, so. We'll create a system where it doesn't matter if these people are out there. Yeah. You know, you still can trust the software. You yeah. can trust the, the mathematics. You can, you know, it's it's just wonderful to have people creating alternative systems like that. Yeah, and I want to be really clear. Like, this is not an aspirational technology either. This isn't a white paper or like an ICO or anything like that. Uh, our blockchain has been live for two years. Mm -hmm. There's something like we're approaching 400,000 pieces of content on there right now. You can find Hollywood films on there. You can find thousands and thousands of different streamers are now publishing their content on there. I actually have all of my videos on there, yeah. so I hedge my bets. No, I, yeah. Even though I'm, I'm live streaming through YouTube at the moment, um, I am on so many different social media platforms, and Library is like one of the greatest ones because it, it just, I know that my information is protected there. I know that it's not going to be taken down. So it's really exciting to have these alternatives. Yeah, and obviously, you shouldn't stop watching this live stream, but maybe as soon as it's over, <laughs> 
you go to the library yeah, and go to the check out the stuff there, and, and it's exactly and the same stuff that you'll find on my albums. <laughs> but there may come a time when, I mean, I've been censored before. Yeah. Um, it, it started out just through advertising, um, but I wouldn't be surprised. Like, I was worried when I did a live stream with Cody Wilson. I'm like, is YouTube going to just remove the video? So as soon as it was done, I, like, downloaded it, just so I yeah. upload it to my library page and knowing that it was going to be there regardless of, of what happened. Yeah. So, you know, the content at the moment is the same across platforms, and that may not always be the case, especially the trajectory that we're going. And I, I don't know if you, you saw this one, but uh, I actually took the Cody Wilson Liberator files and, and put them in an image. Interesting. So, so there's an image, and you can see it on my uh, Twitter. I think it's still my pinned tweet at, at uh -huh. twitter.com slash Jeremy Kaufman. So I, I made an image. You can pass around that image, and with just a, a couple of lines of code, that image can be turned back into the liberator files themselves. And it was really just making a point about how absurd it is to attempt to, to prevent distributing something that's about, you know, it's a megabyte of, yeah. of CAD files. It's not a, you know, people are it's a gun. No, it's not. <laughs> well, also, how it's stupid it is that the, the conversation has all been about, like, will the government allow this to happen? It's like, yeah. it, it already happened. Yeah, yeah. Let's start from there, yeah. you know? There's like, now that we live in a world possible. where people have free distribution of information, you know, how are we going to react to that world? That's the conversation we should be having, not pretending that the government has the power anymore, you know, to, to control all this. They don't. The tables have been turned. Individuals have more power than I think they've ever had, thanks to blockchain technology. So I think the conversation really needs to move ahead, and politicians need to stop this pretense that um, they can control people's behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about your arrest. Uh, I was going to ask I didn't know what segue I was going to get to that. <laughs> that very smooth segue. Oh, yeah. Arrest. Um, so it just came up naturally, you know. Naturally, <laughs> naturally. Um, so you live in um, Newcastle, Australia. Yeah. Um, Australia. Yeah. 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 Manchester, and they have um, pretty strict rules there. So there was a there was a shooting yesterday. Apparently, whenever there's a shooting, they have lockdown on the entire city. You can't leave your house. Yeah, so, I don't know the scope. I just uh, obviously it's an outrageous situation. But I don't need to make it more outrageous than it was in reality. Right. Yeah, I, it, it Maybe was, it was a, yeah. it, Oh my god! It was, violation. <laughs> it, it was a violation. Uh, so we <laughs> we could be outraged. It was a, I don't know the exact size. It wasn't the whole city. It was at least a couple of blocks. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that I and I happen to live on. Okay, there. so yeah. you had to go pick up your kid, and uh, you got arrested for leaving your house. Yeah, it, it was it was it was quite out quite outrageous. One of the most outrageous things that's ever happened to me personally. And again, and actually, I was I was I was live streaming it. Uh, so you can also find the video of the two minutes leading up to my live streaming. I was live streaming it. So <laughs> you can see both the, the live stream of me getting arrested as well as everyone's reaction in real time as they watch me get arrested. Uh, and I got arrested for disorderly conduct. I was, you can see it in the video, you know, I was speaking, you know, I was speaking calmly. I wasn't, I wasn't being confrontational. I wasn't being aggressive. I was, I was actually just asking, you know, why am I not allowed to leave? Uh, it did turn out, uh, and it, <laughs> the cops were trying to catch a guy who had evidently shot someone about eight hours earlier. Yeah. He didn't even end up, he didn't end up being in the building. I wasn't that close to the building. I could have left. In, I was closer standing where I was. I was trying to go in the opposite direction, essentially, yeah. of where they thought he was. Right. And I was not allowed to go in that direction. I was allowed to be at my house. And also, when the officer arrested me, he literally walked me while handcuffed and holding me you know, directly in front of the place that what that they were were trying to control. So if there was any serious danger, he certainly didn't feel it for himself, right? Because he, <laughs> he, he didn't show any sign of concern walking you know, the exact area that I was interested in. In, in, in crossing myself. And so yeah, I was not allowed to leave my property. The way that the, you can see in the video, they blocked both sides of the street off. Wow. Uh, so I wasn't allowed to leave my house. Wow, so what happens to people in that situation if they have to pick up their children? Like, let's say someone's just been shot. Yeah. You kind of want to get to where your kid is. And you that, want to protect them. And that is the thing is, you know, there was no, the cop, by the officer, and you'll see the video, he never says anything. He yeah. never says this is a crime scene, he never says this is an active investigation, he just says, you're not allowed to go this way. But that's the only thing he would assert to me, was you're not allowed to go this way. And I didn't know, I didn't even, to be clear, I didn't make the videos, you know, I didn't understand all of this that was going yeah. on. It's just, there's just a police officer down yeah. on my street saying, you're not allowed to go this way. I'm not someone who, you know, I, I'm not going to immediately get in his face, but I'm not going to take, wow. I'm going to at least ask questions, I'm going to take that line down. And, um, and it didn't take very many questions, all asked very calmly before he 
consider that to be disorderly oh conduct. Oh my gosh, that's insane that it just escalates so quickly and you don't have people using common sense and you know rationality in these situations. It's like, no, yeah. I have a monopoly on force in this situation and I'm going to abuse it. But I will, it seems I will say the cool thing, and I do want to, um, I think this is something that happens across the United States. I don't think it's something that's unique to New Hampshire or yeah. unique to Manchester. Yeah, something that is unique to living in New Hampshire is, you know, I, I was at the police station, well one, before I'd even left the scene, people had arrived. Uh, at the scene, like I was in the, I wasn't the policeman at this point, but I could see uh, friends of mine who, really? had, uh, who had arrived uh, at the police station. There were already several people who had arrived at the police station in advance of me um, uh, to take care uh, to take care of everything. Wow. I've already gotten that's nice. That's a nice yeah, community. Right I, there. I've gotten introduced to council. There's a group of people who are dedicated to fighting this kind of thing, wow. and and they are making progress. Uh, so that's definitely so a, like a sort of special part. So like pushing back against um, the sort of overreach and unnecessary use of Yeah, force. I mean, you could look at former former Free State Project president, Carla Garrick, who uh, had a foundational case basically affirming that we had the right to, re to record police officers. Mm -hmm. and, and she actually, not only did she affirm that right via court case, won a settlement from, I don't know if it was the state or the city government, um, but won a settlement uh, from the government uh, because they improperly arrested her for mm -hmm. filming police officers. Wow. And it, that was significantly Carla's doing, but it was also the doing of the other people who got involved in the situation, the, the lawyers who got involved, and so on. And so that's definitely a special part of living in New Hampshire. So find a lot more people who care about this thing up here than, that's really than you nice. know in other areas. That's really, really cool. It seems like a great community of people who are all just fighting for really great things. So actually, before you go, can I, um, I should have asked you this before we went on air. I'm going to say yes. So. Um, I want to give you an end, a verified stance. Uh, so yeah. I'll tell you the story of this. Um, I MC a lot of conferences in okay. the space, and uh, and one of my friends, Dean, who writes this weekly song challenge for me, he said, "Listen, it's not a real conference unless it's Naomi verified. Yeah. Like, you know, unless she's MCing it, we don't believe in it." <laughs> and so he created this stamp for me, and I actually had it made because I thought it was hilarious. And it says, "Bitcoin MC verified." Oh. So can I verify you? Please, please, right. yeah. I assume this is cryptographically secured. <laughs> it's, it's cryptographically <laughs> secured. I'm giving you. This is my private key, uh, and I'm about to ah, give yes. you my public key there. Right. And, uh, yeah, that's how it works. Beautiful. That's how blockchain works. <laughs> that's exactly everything exactly. you need to know. Actually, can I, can I do two of oh, yeah, <laughs> We've, uh, we've got Patrick back here. Verified. Absolutely. I'm verifying everyone, guys. <laughs> All right, so there you go, Dean. It's official. It's official. People Beautiful have been verified writing. at this conference. This is a verified conference, and it's a verified awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremy, Thank for chatting with me. All right, Chris, <laughs> hop up here. Dean will be really happy, Mama. <laughs> I, uh, I, I definitely um, got the, the verifying step ready. So, you uh, would have seen, I can't, there's, there's a lunch in the, the, the thing. Keys on the car. Uh, in my bag, which is um, uh, somewhere. I think it's uh, over there, or down there. The joy of life. My handbag. No, the little one. <laughs> this is in the middle of the last screen. <laughs> uh, there's a bag under there. Un under okay, give me a second, guys. I should sit here and look pretty. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so we have Chris here. You would have seen him in a live stream yesterday where uh, we were talking about all the glorious things that have happened. He's been in a bunch of my live streams now. Thank you so much for being here. Happy to be here. And I realize we haven't actually ever talked about Smart Cash. This is a project that you've been along, involved with for a long time. And so I just wanted to give you a chance to tell people about it and what you've been working on so they can you know, understand some of your background. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, that's kind of what I'm doing here anyway. Uh, Smart Cash is a uh, business-focused, community-driven cryptocurrency. I like to say we're trying to put the currency back in crypto. Uh, we feel a lot of the other projects talk about being used as money, but a lot of them seem to be focused in other, maybe more flashy areas. Uh, we're focused on fast, cheap, easy transactions. Our average transaction fee is less than a tenth of a cent. Uh, block time is 55 seconds, and we have an instant pay feature that will have a confirmed transaction through recipient's wall in about two seconds. Interesting. And you guys are pretty po popular in Brazil, is it? Like, Smart Cash has really taken off there. Yes, so why do you think that is? Like, what, what's, what is it about places like Brazil that kind of attracts them to Smart Cash? Oh, well, it's a really kind of providential net. Um, Brazil itself has had an interesting financial history. Uh, their average inflation rate since 1990 is 206, or rather 368% a year, but that's because of their uh, hyperinflation in the 90s, 
and five percent target inflation since. I'm not really sure uh, why they targeted five percent. Yeah, why is that but, something you want to ask for? Give it five percent of the value of your savings every year. But, you know, I love talking to some of the older people there who, you know, they worked in grocery stores in the 90s, and they remember during this period of hyperinflation, they had to change prices in their supermarket three times a day. That's you know, insane. The banks had to be open overnight simply so you could cash your check and use it to buy things before the money was worthless. So, so they remember that. And also, Brazil has impeached at least two of its presidents in the last couple decades. Yeah. So they, have, they don't have trust in their banks, and they don't have trust in their government. So it's kind of a ripe ground for cryptocurrency. Yeah, it seems like uh, it would do very, very well there. And so why um, is it just because of your outreach efforts through Smart Cash, or, I mean, the outreach efforts of Smart Cash, that people that are interested in it? Or is there something particular about Smart Cash that uh, would be good for people in Brazil? Uh, a lot of it really is because one of our developers was located in Brazil, was a native there. And so he was able to, he's, like, you know, Enrique did a ground. good job to put in the hours and get the word out there, work with the exchanges in the area, work with the businesses. So right now in Brazil, you can live 100% on smart cash. Interesting. You can use- Are there, there are enough merchants that accept it that you can just live in that ecosystem? There's enough merchants that accept it and there are, we have a deal with an exchange that we have something called the smart band. That is essentially an NFC chip that you have in a band around your wrist. And as far as the merchant is concerned, they don't really care what they're getting paid. Right. But it gets converted to fiat at the time of exchange. I see. So there are like receivers in the stores mm -hmm. that can use this technology and it doesn't matter what currency is being loaded onto this thing. They yeah. already have the terminal set up. Yeah. So right now the smart bands work with, you can put fiat money directly on them or you can put smart cash on them. And that's that's it. really awesome. That's mm -hmm. really cool. And not only that, but the tools we have lets us pay basically any bill in Brazil. You can pay your rent with smart cash. You can pay your traffic ticket with smart cash. Like, how has the currency been doing in Brazil in recent years? Because I know, I mean, Argentina's had awful um, trouble with hyperinflation. Like, are we looking at relative stability at the moment? And do people like trust the government right now to kind of keep that going? What's what's the situation? Well, they, they managed to keep their target 5%. Keep their target 5%. <laughs> so you would definitely. <laughs> yeah, that, that's enough that you feel it. Year over year, you will feel your money being more flush. So like something like that, I mean, obviously that incentivizes people mm -hmm. to get rid of, you know, what, what, what is the denomination, what is the currency? Oh, that, that's the uh, real. Real? Yeah. Um, and so it makes people want to get rid of their real mm -hmm. uh, because they know that it doesn't, it's not worth them holding on to it unless they're getting, making 5% in their savings <laughs> account to break even. There's no reason to be holding on to this currency. So I can imagine people still wanting to spend mm -hmm. the traditional um, fiat and wanting to earn in something like the cryptocurrency that they know is not going to be inflated away. Yes. Um, have you seen people being like more interested in earning different currencies? There, there's been a lot of interest there. And they've had some interesting things too, like the uh, bank, the exchange we worked with, uh, Stratum. Mm -hmm. Um, they have a fiat exchange in Brazil and in South Africa, so you can buy some fiat in either of these countries. They had an interesting story behind them. Their, their owner, the guy who started them actually, had the banks sort of fighting him, shut down his bank account, shut down his workers' bank, shut down his mom's bank account. Just oh my because, god, yeah. just to be assholes? Uh, apparently, yes. <laughs> and, and he sued them, yeah. and he won. So now everybody in his business walks around the church and say F the banks, and it, it, it's great. They're great people to work with down there. They, they definitely share our mission yeah. of freeing people, and they're trying to expand as much as they can worldwide, yeah. but um, they've really helped us in Brazil and in, in South Africa, too, to an extent, though we're mm -hmm. not, certainly not as much on the ground there. Um, and in Brazil, you know, it, it's great. We're doing a series now where one of our developers down there is teaching people how to live 100% on smart cash there, what to do. He doesn't, he never makes any fiat money. He never converts to fiat money. Uh, I'll correct that. The only fiat money he makes is when he uh, rents his building out to Airbnb when he travels. So when he converts that to smart cash right so away. So the question is, when is smart cash being uh, integrated into Airbnb? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, anybody from Airbnb watching, you know, give That's us a call. Right. Well, for great use in Brazil at least. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, it's a great opportunity that, you know, the political turmoil in Brazil is interesting, despite the fact that they are the biggest economy in South America, and they've been the most stable in South America. Right. It's a beautiful country. But you know, recently their right-wing presidential candidate was stabbed. Like just yeah, a couple of days ago. That, so that was crazy. Tell me through yeah. that. They had, you know, it's like, I mean, it's, it's been pretty corrupt there for uh, a long, long time. Yes. And you had this candidate who, um, it looked like he was going to win. And then he gets stabbed. 
and now he's like he perforated his intestine and yeah. now he like he can't even run anymore so we've gone back to just this monopoly on power yeah it's, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how that shakes out there i know i'm trying to pay attention with our people yeah. in the areas to keep us updated because it's but you know, but that's kind of the, the situation all over the world. Yeah. Politics are just getting crazier and crazier. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't see where the system's going to last in the long term. Mm -hmm. But I have I have strong hopes that cryptocurrency in general and smart cash in particular can be there to give these people the financial tools they need to store their value and not be stolen from constantly and not and not be denied for fact. I, you know, people in lots of these areas they want to start a business. You know, yeah. people in the favelas in Rio de Janeiro they can't accept credit cards or anything because the bank's like, no, we're not going to. That you do that, and even in America, the pot merchants in America Absolutely. can't do credit cards. Yeah. A lot of uh, you know, independent medicine places can't do credit cards. A lot. Well, like, I mean, I also think about places like Airbnb, where they're saying mm -hmm. Paris is now going to get shut down. Or, you know, yeah. all of these major cities. It's like, oh God, Airbnb is such a lifesaver for people who can't afford like this obscene hotel prices and all of the taxes like lay on top of that. And for people who want to make money with Airbnb, mm -hmm. it's so important to say, well, this is a resource I have. This is land that I have. I want to be able to utilize yeah. it and you know take full advantage of it. And to see it shut down is just a travesty. Um, but I would be surprised if Airbnb starts looking into cryptocurrency because if they're going to be, if they're going to have transactions frozen, um, if they're basically going to have it be enforced in certain places by the government's putting pressure on MasterCard and Visa and not processing these, these payments, maybe they should just start looking at cryptocurrency and operating like in the same way that Uber did, you know, where there were regulations against Uber and Uber just said, okay, we're going to operate anyway um, until we turn the tide of, of, um, of what customers want. So, I mean, yeah. cryptocurrency can be so useful in, in all these situations. And I've gotten so used to just talking to you about crypto news and whatnot, I've let it wander far off from Smart Cash in particular. <laughs> and I feel really bad about that because, you know, this is my opportunity to talk to the audience about Smart Cash. No, well, I mean, I love the fact that it's doing so well in Brazil mm -hmm. and it's just such a great use case of this is a place where cryptocurrency is very useful. Mm -hmm. I know that yesterday on the talk, um, we had some like pushback from people saying, like, well, how do we know Dash is being used in Venezuela? Mm -hmm. You know, um, well, so Brazil is kind of like in the mid ground, mm -hmm. right? It's not as bad as Venezuela. And um, it's it's somewhere where you can actually explore it and, and actually see on the ground. Okay, these places are accepting smart yes. cash. You know, you can you can verify that. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and, and Brazil itself is more friendly to crypto. I mean, it, it is nice that the government has not tried to give it away at this. Or in Venezuela, I mean, all of the fiat exchanges have been shut down. Yeah. Like you cannot buy cryptocurrency with fiat in Brazil except through local bitcoins, local bitcoin cash. Yeah. That's how people do it there. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately in Venezuela, there, there's some graphs going around about how you know BTC is taking off in Venezuela because it looks like this, and, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, <laughs> but that's the inflation <laughs> graph. That, that's what their inflation looks like, that is their volume in their local money. If you actually look at the BTC volume of local bitcoins, it's basically flat when compared to USD. You can see it rise and fall with the price. Yeah. Because, I also um, love the graphs like that, where it's like, Bitcoin is going right up. It's yeah. like, doesn't that just mean that the value of the US dollar is going down as well? Exactly, like, yes. It's kind of bit above. Yeah, that, that, that is a perfect Every example of Every time I buy though. Bitcoin, I feel like I'm shorting fiat. So. <laughs> that, that's the goal. I mean, really, that's what we want, is fiat to go away. At least fiat as we define it as government issued right. money. Where if you talk to some people like Robert Murphy, he might say fiat is any money that's not gold based, but no, I mean, I Mary Voorhees has it right. It's like money by decree; it has yes. to be enforced. Though there's there's some talk about how in the Mises, original Mises human action, um, it's really a translation issue that mm -hmm. we would say that where he's really talking about. But that's a whole. That, that, you get pretty deep in the Austrian weeds there. <laughs> <laughs> that's for another episode. Well, I mean, smart cash is awesome. It's, it seems like uh, it's not just a currency. It's also got all these other aspects of platforms. Yeah. So give me a quick overview about that before we head out into the festival. Uh, absolutely, smart cash is is here to make buying and selling person to person as easy as possible. We have the fast transaction times. We have our smart card that'll let you walk around with smart cash on a card and pay for it that way and the merchant can trust that transaction in two seconds. So it's basically a standard either NFC transaction or um, you know, debit card, you put your PIN transaction. And we're trying to make it as easy as possible to use. Um, we're, we're trying to advance that, integrate all our systems together. We have our web wallet that makes it really easy. You can go on our web wallet, uh, deposit any crypto, change it, we'll change it to Smart Cash right there in our wallet. It's really easy. 
Uh, you can go buy us on various exchanges and trade us there. Um, we are adding, we are trying to expand merchants everywhere as much as we can, even in Venezuela, despite the issues they're having. Um, I just talked with three merchants there a couple days ago about them set up on the smart card, which is awesome. I love that. Um, smart Cash is community driven, and with that, we have a community fund where uh, roughly 50% of every block reward goes into this community fund, and everybody who holds smart cash can vote on it. So one smart cash is one vote. And these, these proposals go from anywhere from, hey, I need some funds to go talk to local businesses, give them stickers, get them set up, or I want to do a local meetup, like we have a group in California, trying to do regular meetups at the schools and the regionals, get businesses on board with smart cash. Um, we have- So what, what is the inflation schedule of smart cash? Uh, we have a curve inflation. Unlike a lot of coins that do, this is the block where we have halvings. Mm -hmm. We actually have a curve, it's basically a logarithmic curve, and um, we're actually going to inflate out into 2140. But for the rest of the 21st century, it's going to be relatively low and flat. Um, we, we want to have long-term support through what we assume will be a slow adoption, crypto adoption period in the 21st century. We don't want to run out of funding halfway through. Um, we are entirely self-funded. We did no ICO. We did no pre-mine. We started from block zero on July 11, 2017, so a little over a year from now. I'm going to like to say that 7-Eleven uh, gives out free store for a Genesis block. <laughs> and um, that's a stupid joke, and I love it anyway. Um, and we are entirely self-funded that way. Um, unlike some other cryptos, we have our development fund that's actually separate from the community fund, so we can't take from the community to fund development, and the community's not going to take from our set development funds either, so we're a little bit more stable in that even in this bear market. Uh, for example, you know, people like Ben Swan have actually come to Smart Cash to continue funding their project. Interesting. He was with Dash, right? He was with Dash, and um, I'm not going to you know, talk bad about anybody, so, but Ben Swan felt that you know, he would get a better fit with us than with Dash versus pushing through their proposal system. Interesting. So right now, if you watch Ben Swan, you'll see brought to you by Smart Cash. Huh, very interesting. Cool. So we, we try to- And is that somewhere where if other people, if other mm -hmm. artists or um, activists have different projects that they were funding, they can go, is there like a proposal for? There's a proposal system. We, we like a pre-proposal on the form. Obviously, people talk about it, get feedback. And there's the official proposal section where anybody can, anybody who holds smart can vote on that proposal. Mm -hmm. And the goal there is the proposal is supposed to you know, help smart cash. Mm -hmm. This isn't like a Shark Tank style thing. This yeah. is a, you know, the, the high teams don't need to do everything. Like, I don't know what your village in Ghana needs. Like, I, I don't know what, you know, Lagos mm -hmm. needs in Nigeria. People yeah. who are local there do, mm -hmm. and they can come to us saying, hey, it's going to cost me this much mm -hmm. to do these events and try to get people on board. And that, that's what we're trying to push forward with these proposals is everybody getting involved. Because in the, over the history of things, people have gotten so separated from their money and they consider it you know, just this thing, this abstract concept. But really money is all about our value. And money is supposed to go towards what we value and actually help us do things easier, not have all these complex steps that our money has turned into now. So Smart Cash is trying to make it easy to move money no, you know, we talked about trustlessness a little bit yesterday, yeah. and that's, that's the whole point. There's nobody in between you and who you're trying to pay. Yeah. And we're also trying to make sure that the community stays involved with where everything's going and is able to help push forward their ideals with the community. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're all about handcap ideals here. Are there any, like, faucets available if people want to get started? Um, smart cash, they can go to one of these and just kind of get like 0.001 or whatever they get to start. Uh, we don't have any faucets right now. We have um, the various tools of getting involved in Discord and Steam it, okay. and even Twitter, but we don't, we're not, it's not being given away like okay. that. But a lot of people have got started in Discord by helping out. I mean, I wasn't there at the very start of Smart Cash. I joined in a couple months later. And, you know, I just got started because I was in the community helping people. Interesting. And that was, I was a community member helping people out before the team said, hey, you seem to, I don't know what you're doing, and you should come join us. Enjoy. And of course, you know, they asked, hey, you want to go talk at events? I'm like, no, I'm an IT guy. I don't like being in front of people. And now you talk and... on my show almost every day. <laughs> What's going on? I'm pretty safe. Well, yeah. This has been really wonderful, just learning about mm -hmm. what you're actually doing and, and getting viewers. Like when you came on, everyone's like, Southport! <laughs> <laughs> because they know you from uh, yeah. CEO every week. Um, That's great. So I really uh, appreciate your time yeah. today and on the live show. It's always great to catch up with what's going on in the scene. I'm just going to be before I sign off, I'm just going to take you on a little tour outside, everyone who's watching, just to show you a little bit like the speakers are going on, I'll show you the outside, and then I'll, I'll sign off out there. So, uh,
I'll I'll leave my for now. a little bit so that uh, I don't disturb the speakers. So um, I'll just show you what's going on. gotten to use it. I mean, that's a, to a certain extent, it's a little bit of a scary thought because it's like, why are you working as decentralized money? Then you don't need to do that. Outside, we've got some vendors in here. We got a little, little tight go before that. Oh, hi. Oh, you want to say hello to everyone? Hi everyone! <laughs> How's everything going with your campaign? Very good, thank yeah. you, yes. So, so. Do you want to like, say hi to everyone? This is a live stream. Okay. Just tell them what, what you're running for. Hi, my name is Carla Garrick. I'm running for state senate here in the free state of New Hampshire. I'm running in District tw uh, 20, which is Gosstown and Manchester. We're out on the free coast today yeah. for a wonderful festival. Lots of crypto, lots of good people, lots of free market ideas, which is something I stand for and is part of my platform. And actually, um, Matt mentioned Carla Hi. earlier in the live stream. You would have uh, heard him talking about her. So this is the, the wonderful lady that, um, that we were talking about. So. And uh, yeah, so excited that everyone's checking in with us and <laughs> come to the Free State Project. Come Absolutely. to New Hampshire. We need you guys. Such a such an awesome group. Well, you guys are lovely. Thank Great you. to see you. Great All to right. see you. Peace Gonna wander, wander through here and see. Just have a look at the couple of booths here. Liberty in the Free State. Oh, actually, here's a smart cash booth. So we were just chatting about smart cash, and now you can uh, see some of their cool stuff here. It's a uh, porcupine real estate going on. Little treats is there. What is this here? Go to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm John Light. <laughs> also known as Light Queen on Twitter. Awesome. Yes. And what have we got here? What is this? Uh, so I'm representing Aragon. Okay. Uh, we are on Ethereum, like that makes it easy for people to create and participate in DAOs, or decentralized hey, organizations. Cool. Alright, that's cool. And where can people find out more? Uh, Aragon.org. Aragon.org. Yeah, and uh, we are hiring. Oh, Whoa, we are hiring. So, uh, there's some information for you all. Uh, if you uh, want to check that out, thanks for, for chatting. Some uh, cool things here. Awesome little swaggy things. Here. So there's a uh, there's a lot of stuff going on around here. I'll uh, take you outside. Hi. Hello. And Jeremy again. All right. I'll take you outside and then I'll I'll sign off because I don't want you guys having to follow me around. Okay. Um, but hi there. All right, so uh, actually, you know what? Let's uh, let's go over here. Vin, I'm on live stream. You want to say hi? Yes, of course. <laughs> Guys, the one and only Vin Armani right What's here. Up? Say hi. <laughs> so uh, we have people tuning, giving them a taste of what the uh, Free Coast Festival is like. I've introduced them to some of the speakers, mm -hmm. and we talked about all kinds of things, all areas of freedom. And uh, now we have the wonderful Vin. Do you want to just like give us, because last time I was on your show, yes, and right. we were talking about me. And yes, uh, right. so it's really great to just have you here in this impromptu. That's so fortuitous. Talking about like you actually just stopped your show. I was the final yes. episode on you your show. You were the show. final guest, yes. And that was pretty cool. Um, but you're doing awesome things uh, in the space. So just tell people briefly like what you're working on, when they can find you now. So one of the reasons that I came to New Hampshire, I've only been here since April, but I had been coming out for uh, several years and speaking at events. I came to this event uh, last year, I think it was my first year, uh, is because of my company. 
Cointex, Cointex.io, which is an SMS wallet for now multiple currencies, but we started with Bitcoin Cash. Uh, and going into, we're in 10 countries now, we're about to release uh, our Spanish language mm -hmm. countries. We're uh, actually on Monday, Mexico, Spain, um, Chile, Argentina, Guatemala, mm -hmm. and moving on to some more. We'll be in 54 countries by the, oh, got low battery. Oh no! <laughs> uh, we'll be in 54 countries by the end of the year and then That's multiple so cool. multiple currencies. So uh, with BTC, Litecoin, um, Dash, I think I'm gonna add Smart Cash too. Oh yeah! Uh, just added Ravencoin, yeah. Bruce Fenton's coin, and I know you're gonna be back here for for that conference I'm in hoping October. Hoping to, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll so. see, but uh, but the plan too. Okay, so so yeah, I mean, this is a great place for. I think that this has the potential to be the Silicon Valley slash Wall Street of cryptocurrency. I totally agree. Yeah. I just vibe here. All of the people who are working on all of these decentralized projects and blockchain projects, um, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I mean, I had lunch with. Uh, one of the uh, community, uh, one of one of the community managers for Smart Cash at the table was Jeremy Kaufman, the CEO of Library. Yeah. Chris Pacia, lead developer of uh, Open Bazaar, <laughs> yeah. and it was just like, and the, there's the four of us out. just sitting, just yeah. having lunch. It's like Absolutely. you don't get that anywhere else. No, it's, it's I love it's, it here. It's amazing. Like when I um I came out to to lunch here, and you can see like everyone's kind of like in this little restaurant here hanging out, and now the people are inside. People are around ports so like the the ye old Bitcoin shop and the oh yeah, yeah. and the any and, and the two developers of AnyPay are here, and yeah. it's just like and it's and everybody's friends. I know that's the great thing about it. Yeah, and is it it doesn't feel tribal here. Like one thing I noticed no. about the crypto community is it's like got this crazy toxicity and this yes, tribalism agreed, agreed. and um and that bothers me a lot because i think we're all on the same side you mm -hmm. know we want more empowerment for the individual we want more freedom in mm -hmm. our lives and you come to a place uh like new hampshire where people have literally come here for the community yes and that makes all the difference people are coming here not because they want their project to win and not because right. you know they're, they're just in it for for like bad reasons they want to shut down other projects mm -hmm. or anything like that um you have people who come here because they want to be part of a community and they're excited to collaborate mm -hmm. and they're excited to work with new people and they're excited to have competition i mean i had oh, joel sure. and i had chris on my show yesterday and that's so that's like that's you know, yeah. dash and, and smart Art cash, cash yeah. and they're just you know great you know mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're friends and and everyone is just loving hearing both of them just like chat about ideas and different approaches to things and i just yeah i love this community so if anyone wants to check out like the the free state project oh, you, you or... have to the, i will tell you you have to come to an event because it's not until you experience yeah. like because it, it, it can seem like maybe like a potemkin village like the what's put <laughs> forward in terms right. of the marketing of the free state yeah. project it's all for real and much more i mean I'm a hard sell. I'm a skeptic, and I, I, it did not take long to sell me at all. Yeah. And I love it here. It's great. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, thank you so much for thank chatting you. with me. And on that note, I'm going to sign off, guys. So thank you for tuning in. So and, I'm your uh, last guest. Yeah, I'm your, your, <laughs> my last guest. Just to return the favor. So thank you for tuning in, and I love you guys all so much. And uh, this has been been really, really awesome. All right, see you guys.